following is a video presentation of an evening worship service at Orville Baptist Church.
service, reading from uh, the Word of God, and um, starting in verse 4 of uh, 2 Timothy, same book we read from this morning, a uh, set of verses that are usually charged to pastors and uh, new pastors, and I, I remember, I still remember the ordination here, and Mike crushed me in that message, and part of uh, part of the text that he used was from 2 Timothy, encouraging to, we all know, the most popular part of Second Timothy 4 is to preach the word. And um, certainly is true for, for pastors and charged to pastors. And um, also charged to the people of God. Pastor, elder, deacon, lay person, whoever it may be. And so I want to read from 2 Timothy 4 to remind us of, of our calling and the world that we live in. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. By his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, in your hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul continues, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also all who have loved is appearing. It is not simply a command and a good bit of wisdom or advice for pastors. It is truth for all. It is truth for all Christians. And I routinely say we talk about the end times as if they are something to come in the future. And I tell you the truth that the moment that Christ ascended, the end times began. We are living in those end days. We, we've been in those end times for, for some time now. And I don't know if it be tomorrow. Um, the true end, the culmination of all of the end could be next month or it could be a hundred years from now. I do not know. But what I do know is this, we have a calling. And um, before that time is up, we are commanded to preach the word, to be ready in all seasons, to be ready to recruit, to rebuke, to exhort with great patience and great instruction to do these things, to basically be obedient to the calling of what it means to be a Christian, to go out into the darkness and be alive, to preach the, the word of God. And to do so in a place, in a world, among a people. That sadly is, is real. But you see these, these words come, come true. Rejecting the truth. Turning to myths. Wanting their ears to tickle. We see that each and every day. It's happening in this time and it's still happening today. We're not called to be popular. We're not called to be powerful. We're, we're called to preach the word. And that is exactly what we will do as people look up. I want to welcome you tonight. Um, we ran out of time this morning, so we're going to continue on uh, when we get to our, our message, reading from Acts 16. Um, had, had a little bit left on the table there. Uh, had a wonderful service this morning. I uh, was very, very encouraged um, by our, our fellowship, our, our time together, and our, our worship together. And uh, It was a, a great blessing to have Frank and Sharon come forward and want to join our church and to see all of our hands raised and, and praising God for bringing them to us, and uh, continue to pray for their family. They just, I, he may have mentioned it this morning when he got up there, I don't know. But they, uh, they welcomed a new grandchild into the world of pride, and so uh, always a blessing just to just the gift of life. And uh, they are uh, already proud of grandparents now they've added to uh, that family tree. And so um, he said, everyone's doing fine, baby doing great, mother's doing great. Uh, so, so wonderful news. We rejoice with them. He said, the only thing that's going to keep us from coming tonight is we're going to see our baby. I said, well, you go see your baby. And uh, so we rejoice with them and welcome this new life into the world. And, and we pray for the mother. Uh, we pray for, for, this, for this new child. And, uh, what, a, what a great family that we, uh, we have been, been, been given, essentially, uh, and brought here. And uh, they want to serve, and we're going to give them opportunities. And so looking forward to ministering to them and with them. But it's been a good day. Uh, Carol and I were talking before uh, service. Should have gone outside today at some point. If you didn't, it's a shame. It's an absolutely gorgeous day today. Apparently, the 
Karen had commented that half of you will look out to the sky that was painted this afternoon and say there is no doubt. I mean, just absolutely beautiful. Um, and so we, we got rain, 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 and we need rain. And then it was nice to have this, this beautiful canvas that we saw God go to work with this morning or this afternoon. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And uh, we'll see what happens next Sunday, but I think we'll call it for rain again. <laughs> so far it's just rain, but we'll see. They're always wrong. And we'll find out. I think at one point it was the rain today. You saw how it turned out. So uh, we'll see. Uh, but I'm looking forward to um, our week together. Uh, remember Wednesday night? Continue on with Sermon on the Mount. It's been a very fruitful uh, section of scripture for us to go through in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I have loved every moment. I've loved every word of us walking through this together. I've uh, been very fruitful in my own life. Um, I'm not just, not just teaching and preaching to others, I'm teaching and preaching to myself. And so um, it's been a really good study. I hope you'll join us on Wednesday in the Hayes Fellowship Hall at 6.30 on, on Wednesday. Continue on in that, in that message. And then I want to remind you, of course, uh, for next Sunday, our schedule being a little different. Uh, we will be meeting at 10.30 instead of 11. So we'll be in Sunday school. Um, we'll be meeting at 10.30 for a very monumental, uh, very important uh, day for us. And uh, I'm looking forward to that next Sunday. And so uh, continue to prepare your hearts. And pray for, pray for uh, what's next in our lives. What's next for us in church? Um, so I'll be doing, seeking God's will in all things, and, and I invite you to join me in that. Continue to remember, uh, as we started off this morning, officially, um, this new, again, we didn't, I, I remember people had some catchy phrase for it, but uh, we we're essentially asking that um, our people commit $5 a Sunday to this new repair and renovation fund. Uh, we just feel that we, we need to be preparing for some things that need to be fixed around our property, and some things that we need to be prepared for for the future. Um, so um, we took that up this morning. Again, don't want to count or anything, but I appreciate uh, us coming together to do that. And this will remind you, we'll kind of get a routine of that every, every Sunday. Uh, eventually, I will have um, you know, custom-made envelopes to always have in the queue. Um, still got a couple boxes left of these, of these smaller envelopes. And that's the same thing we're going to operate for a couple weeks. Um, just use those small envelopes in the queues front of you. Um, if you use one of those, I will know, and we will know exactly what that money is for. It's for the repair and renovation fund. Eventually, um, I, won't, I won't do boxes that have your name and sit home, nothing like that. We'll just continually have them replenished uh, in the views um, for that specific fund. We'll keep those available for the future. So just, just look forward to that. Um, had, a, had a great service this morning. Um, I pray that you were blessed this morning with our time together. I'm really, uh, there's, there's, it's not, not a certain Sunday that don't mean anything to you. I don't want to get that impression, but there's certain moments that happen in church services. Um, they just, they just kind of hit, they, they hit hard. Um, not take away from, from any other Sunday. Um, it was just a, a sweet, it was a sweetness to our time together this morning. You know, sometimes uh, you wish you could just bottle it up and you could make a fortune selling that. Um, it was a sweetness to our, our time together this morning that I greatly appreciated it. And just relish in. And, um, it's been a good day. It's been a really, really good day. I'm looking forward to what God is doing in, in our midst here. And, um, I'm just very, very honored to be a pastor. I'm very honored to, to be here with you and to be your brother in Christ. And so, so I just want, just want to tell you that I, that I appreciate you and I love you. And I'm very thankful for each and every one of you.
detour. Um, as I mentioned, not, not going to go through the church at, at Pergamum from, from Revelation 2 tonight. Going to continue on in Acts 16. I honestly did not even... That's kind of a surprise. Did you realize I didn't even rant that much that, this morning? I didn't get off subject too much, and I still didn't have any time. That's just, that's just sad. But before I knew it, it was, it was noon, and time was up. So uh, that's all right. This happens every now and then. Uh, either way, I had, had a great service, and like I said, it's good to have Frank and Sharon come forward and look forward to serving with them. Uh, we basically got through about halfway uh, through our message. We'll see if we use up all of our time here tonight. Get out early. You're not going to complain. Uh, so we'll see how much we get through. But uh, just to bring us, I'm going to jump right in uh, from where we were this morning. Just to bring us up to speed, uh, Paul and Silas are now uh, in jail. They've been thrown into jail. Uh, they were arrested for causing chaos. And uh, I kind of need some specifics there. Um, you know, basically against Roman rule, I should say, I guess it's the best word to use. You could not introduce religions or practices or worship that was not authorized from, from Caesar. Um, you had to worship Caesar anyways. So to come in with this message that they came in with was certainly anti-Rome, um, not to overthrow Rome, but they, they didn't like it. And so they used it as a perfect opportunity, uh, these masters of the slave world, to go and turn them into the magistrates and say, look at all the chaos they're causing. And they're not really causing chaos. Um, it's, it's, it's overblown. But she's a fortune teller, so when this spirit left her, as Paul commanded the spirit to do, these masters lost their source of income for her. They don't care about her. We talked about that this morning. They, they, they did not care about her actual personal life. They just cared about the money that she was able to make, and the money they could make off of her ability. And these wicked men had no concern for her actual life at all. Um, and so I honestly don't see the charges being very, quote, fair in actual Roman law. That's why it was done so quickly. Uh, they didn't have a fair trial. They didn't have any kind of actual hearing, nothing like that. It was just all in one swift motion. Beat them up, uh, call them accused and, and, and call them guilty, and then throw them into jail and just be done with them. And so they're beaten. It's a very severe beating. The text is not explicit in just how bad the beating was, but I'm telling you, the Romans are not known for their gentleness. They're not known for being teddy bears. They're known for being Maulers. Uh, they, were, they were experts in torture. And I kind of went through the typical beatings they would do on the street. Um, these praetors, they had these rods. Uh, basically, they didn't bundles and they would, they would whip you with them. And they, they hurt them, take the skin off. And so uh, they were beaten to the point they could function, obviously. Um, but this wasn't a slap on the wrist by, by, any, by any measure. Very harsh treatment that they received. And they're thrown to jail. Awful, awful conditions. I even shared this morning. During this time, there wasn't any kind of bathroom breaks. There wasn't anything like that. They were putting stocks, um, very, very, very painful stocks. They first started with just kind of discomfort. Then it turned into cramps. Then it turned into shooting pain. Then it turned into torture. Um, just being in those stocks for hours. You moved the bathroom in these, in these cells. You went where you were. And you stayed there. And there wasn't any kind of rag to give you to clean up. No, you just sat it. Um, so these, these conditions are, are not are not good, very nasty, very rotten jail, incredibly filthy, very dark, very grimy. And so Paul sees an opportunity despite all of these things. He sees this wonderful opportunity kind of unfolding, slowly being brought to them. And he knows that he and Silas are being brought through this for a reason, guys, opening doors. And in this case, it's both spiritual and, and liberal, uh, as, we, as we kind of talked about this morning. So let's pick up, we're going to do a little bit of what we did already, uh, with reason. Uh, starting back up in verse 25, we'll read this section in its entirety once more, down to verse 30. Uh, we, we, we basically did this this morning, but I, there's some other things I want to see. So, verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So there are several things that I, were not, I was not able to get to this morning. For the sake of time. But first, we'll begin in verse 25. What time were they praying and singing, singing hymns? Midnight. I'm fascinated by that. I'm absolutely fascinated.
fascinated by the time frame that's happening here. To me, this is pretty incredible. Right? I want to ask, what are we doing at midnight? But what I should say is, what should we be doing at midnight? I'm not sleeping at midnight. I'm the first to admit I do not get as near enough sleep as I need. I'm constantly up past midnight, but should be sleeping. And even here at midnight, typically, you'd be sleeping. And in jail, there's nothing else to do. You kind of run out of things to do other than sit there and, and sit in your own field. But especially by the time midnight rolls around, you would think you'd be able to, to get some type of sleep. And I don't know the context here, okay? I don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes. I don't know if they just couldn't sleep or they just didn't. If they couldn't, couldn't get any sleep, couldn't get any peace, or they just didn't want to. Either way, it's incredibly late. It's very late in the night, and they're praying and singing praise to God. And I want you to put yourself in that situation for, for just a moment. If you're a prisoner in the jail in these rotten conditions, and these two new guys are thrown in there with you, and it's midnight, and you're here to pray, and then they start singing, what are you going to do? I'm going to yell in the hall, shut up! I'm trying to sleep. This is jail. Don't you know where you're at? And yet, they just keep on doing it. I don't know. I wasn't there. It doesn't say that those men that, were, that was mad at them. But at some point, I bet when they first started singing, I bet there was some, some words. What are you guys doing? Don't you know where you are? How can you sting right now? What, are you, what, do, you, what do you think you're doing? And right there in that moment, God was putting together an audience. In that, in that prison, God was delivering over an audience to Paul and to Silas. The text says they were listening. At some point, they began to listen. There wasn't any kind of, hey, what are you guys doing? Shut up. You see that? They were listening. It says they were listening. They weren't upset and yelling at Paul and Silas. I'm willing to bet they did it first, but eventually they just listened. Listening more intently to what they were saying. And again, as I said this morning, they heard a faith they could not ignore. They heard out loud a faith that they, kept, that they could not ignore. And how could they sing this way in general? In, in these conditions. Now, this is really difficult to do because life does have this experiential quality to it. We, we really do hurt. We really do feel pain. We really do suffer. That pain is real. You can't just, hey, get better. And it goes away. And I, I mean, I'm not going to get into advice time, but a lot of times we go through stuff, and there, especially people who are maybe even depressed, and say, we're just trying to get feeling better. It does, it's not that easy. It doesn't work like that. You ever been down before and someone says, you know, just kind of think better, get better? It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. There's a real experiential pain in this life. And this is very difficult to do because it's very easy for things to be going good and having good times, and you can still forget about your faith. What happens when it's bad? It's going to do one of two things. Either going to push you further away, or it's going to provide a platform. And I think you should see this attitude change happen here. I mean, imagine sharing your faith when circumstances are really, really difficult, when they're incredibly difficult. I think we should learn something about this kind of attitude from Paul and Silas, where we see an opportunity to whine when they see an opportunity to worship. That's, that's beautiful. They could have been wallowing in their own field, saying all kinds of things, and yet they do, they do something else. They worship. They go to come with the praise. And I'm telling you this right now, the world is watching us. The world is watching us. In many cases, the world is watching us to see us fail and to fall. Watching the hypocrites back to a normal thing once again. Right now, this, this past week, we, the, the church at large is being called out because there's another school shooting. We're being, we're being exposed as hypocrites because we offer thoughts and prayers and do nothing more. I'm trying to use that as an opportunity to say that we're, we don't do anything other than just offer meaningless thoughts and prayers. While the rest of the world does nothing on top of that as well. You'll, you'll see the world is watching us to see what we're doing next. And in many cases, they're finding faults in us that we, we give those to them willingly. We give them the ammunition to make that kind of, that kind of judgment about us. When in reality, we've been given a major platform in many of our circumstances, especially difficult circumstances. We have this, this stage that has been set before us, and God has given us an opportunity. And when I say it's time for us to give them a show, I don't mean in an entertaining way. I mean to put on an expression of this love for God that no one can ignore. That when we're at our, our worst in our personal lives, it's pain and it's hurt, 
and terrible, terrible circumstances, the world is watching to see what we're going to do. We need to be people who offer up praise, who offer up worship. Our attitude should reflect that prison that's holding Paul and Silas. If the world's going to watch us, let's show them what our faith means. Let's show the world what our faith truly is. It is really, really, really difficult to ignore a Christian who sings praise in the Baptist. It's very, very difficult to ignore that type of thing. It's very easy for us to walk in here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening or go to the Hayes Fellowship Hall on Wednesday evening, have a great day, and have smiles on our faces, and, and go through the Psalms, and go through the encouragement, and go through our time together, and it, it seems like, oh, everything's good, everything's happy. But I tell you right now, we see someone in the tears, and they're in the valley, and they're going through incredible circumstances, and they lift their, their Hands to God and give praise to God. You can't hear your eyes break from that. That's something to behold. It's something incredibly special. And the world is looking at us in a very, very same way to see what is it that we're going to do. Very different context. And we're not going through the same kind of persecution that Paul and Silas are going through. We still have an audience. This is part of the reason I pity all the, you know, we talked about this earlier in 2 Timothy, the false teachers and those who follow false teachers. I, I, I have great, great pity on the things that they are, they are following. Because when you inherit earthly riches and the things of this, this world, it, it's in a way very, very sad. It's, it's very, very sad. It can be a blessing. Material things can be a blessing. Don't get me wrong. But have you ever considered, just for a moment, have you ever considered that your supposedly painful situation is, is exactly where God wants you to be? There might be times where we're incredibly painful. Situations, and that's quite where God wants us to be. Just because there's wealth, and just because it's material blessing, doesn't mean it's always exactly what God wants in our life. We might call some things a blessing, but it might not always be a blessing. We can discern what's given from God. But as you see with Paul and Silas, there's times where these kind of things is exactly where God wants us. Do you think for a moment that God is caught off guard with Paul and Silas being in jail? Absolutely not. If anything, this is his will. They are going on this missionary journey. This is where he has placed them. It's, it's, it's a blessing to be in that will. And it seems strange to say things like that, but it's true. This is an attitude issue at its very core. Everything that we go through, all people. There's a God who will use those circumstances for his glory. And is using those circumstances for his glory. So hear me out. God has not always promised that one bad situation will be resolved immediately. It's not always immediate. But he'll actually use it. That is, that is actually for sure. 100%. And I got to introduce this idea this morning. But look at the jailer's reaction. Look back at the text one more. He realized what happened. And he, he, he saw it happen, and he said, my life is over. He said, my life is, is done. As far as he was concerned, life is gone. He initially thought that all the prisoners had left. He saw the doors open, he saw the chains go down, and he didn't go to each cell. He, he just said, they, they're all, they escaped. And so he takes a sword, and he, he kind of puts it up to himself, and he's going he's to commit suicide. And he knows that even if he didn't do it, he'd probably get killed anyways. Rome would probably execute him for his failure. Now remember, this is his life. This is his life to be a jailer. This is his devotion to Rome to be a jailer. His entire existence revolves around this service to Rome. And in one single act, in this earthquake, this movement of God, his entire existence is wiped out. His entire reason for being is reduced to nothingness. He has lost it all. He was even going to commit suicide. At that moment in time, there was no reason for him, in his mind, to live. He saw no value in life because of what had happened. This is where I was getting at this morning, and it didn't quite, was quite able to get there for time, but some people do have testimonies where they're raised in church, and it's wonderful, and I had you raise your hand, that was kind of your story. Um, I was raised in church too, but I had to be brought low. I had to be pretty much uh, brought to my lowest point. For me to see this thirst that I needed to have for God. I wasn't even thirsty yet. I was 
God brought me so low that he said, you need to see why you need a thirst for God. I, I had to go through that for me to have this, this, this thirst for God that it couldn't be you know, quenched by the world. And so I want you to understand what's happening here with this jailer. His whole entire existence is now gone. He's now questioning what is his life all about? What's the reason to live? And if you're asking him in that very moment where he thinks that all the prisoners are gone, there is no reason. It's just nothing. It's an incredibly, incredibly sad moment to, to experience. Now, this is very sad and humbling as well. And I want to share this with you, but there are some incredibly troubling statistics around this country when it comes to suicide. Now, there are many factors that can lead to suicide. It's a very difficult subject for us to even talk about. Don't get me wrong. But there are some really eye-opening numbers that are attached with suicide rates in our country. One of the highest suicide rates belongs to people who live in a, in a, in a specific area, and there, there's a net you know, average income, and they're below it. Those people have an astoundingly high, is astoundingly a word? Astoundingly high suicide rate. People who live in a community in an area that has an average income, and they're below it. Very, very high suicide rate. And then you have to why? You can figure it out on your own. Why not? Why is suicide rate is so high for those people? Because this is the world we live in. We compare each other to what we have and don't have. And so people are looking around saying, I don't have this, and I don't have that. And they've got what I figured out. They got money, they got cars, they got a nicer house than me. I can't, I can't meet those expectations. So they, just, they just kill themselves. How sad is that? And yet the numbers for these people who live in these types of communities is very, very high. Very, very. It shows you what kind of world we live in. Taking off the things that we don't have. I have no reason to live. And looking at it from, from an earthly, worldly standpoint, it's very, very sad. The second one is, you can not have an actual number, you'd be surprised at how high the suicide rate is for CEOs. And for top businessmen, you know, very, very high. Compared to the, the you know, quote, average citizen, very successful business people have an, an, an insanely high suicide rate. And it's just so sad. And we sit here and excuse me and go, why? They got anything they need, they got all the money, they can buy whatever they want. Well, think about how business works. You got everything going perfectly fine one day. What happens with businesses? They, they change constantly. There's businesses that were once worth millions that end up declaring bankruptcy. And it can happen fast. There's people who devote their entire day to work, work, work. That's all they know is work. Their entire life revolves around work. One bad thing happens, one bad thing happens every day in their life. Because that realm of their life is gone. It's just, it's, it's in such a sad, sad reality. When your life revolves around one single thing, and that one thing is taken, to you, taken from you, it seems like misery. It seems like life is gone. The jailer had his entire life right there in front of him. And then it's gone. I've, I've dishonored Rome. I've dishonored myself. I've let these, these men get away. They're going to kill me anyways. Life as I know it is, is completely gone. This is the danger of life without Christ. Honest to goodness. It's a very big danger of life without Christ, without a true purpose. Turning life into something of earthly measure, when in reality, this life is all about Christ. It is all about Him. This life is only about Christ. And that is an offensive statement to the world. You say, you mean I don't mean anything in this world? That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is your deeds are dirty rags. They mean nothing. They mean nothing apart from Christ. True purpose and true life is only found and him. And this is such a beautiful thing to read that the jailer asks what? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It just gives me goosebumps. It's just a beautiful question. And the jailer, he saw all this unfolding. He witnessed Paul and Silas. He witnessed them worshiping, exhibiting their faith. He witnessed their faith in Christ that, that nothing came between them and worship. And he saw this happen. And he heard Paul cry out to him to let him know, we're not gone. We're still here. We have it left. All it took was that brief moment, that one brief moment when he saw that his life was over, that it was empty. That's, that's all God did. That's all he wanted to use. He used that, that brief little window of time, that 
tiny little fraction of time to show the jailer that he needed salvation. And he literally went for one second, having a sword pointed at his stomach, to looking upon the faces of Paul and Silas and asking, what must I do to be saved? That's all God needs. That's all he, that's all he desires. That one moment leading up to that. That's all it takes. To expose the thirst that we have in our lives. The seeking that we have for something greater. Not just the things the world can offer. But to know what true life is that's only found in Christ. It was enough that the jailer came to the conclusion that he needed salvation. He needed to be saved. What a terrific blessing it is to read that statement. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so let's finish up starting at verse 31. We'll, we'll see immediate fruit in his life as well, just like Lydia. So verse 31. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought to them his house and set, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God and his whole household. Wonderful. It's just amazing. It's just absolutely astounding. What, what God did through Paul and Silas in these terrible, horrible, awful circumstances, they, they never suffered without cause. It was never a fruitless suffering. It was always, always with exact cause. They suffered intentionally for the, the cause of Christ. <laughs> At the cost of their very life, they followed Jesus to this filthy cell, jail cell, to this horrific beat, to see this opportunity to make disciples, to share the gospel of Christ. This beautiful message. And we know that there is a difference between true belief and this I say casual belief. And so remember, does the enemy believe? Does the, the, the Satan believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah. More. He knows Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The enemy knows who Jesus is. He knows that he's the Son of God. And yet he's still the enemy. We're talking about a true belief, a real belief that bears fruit, a saving belief, so to speak. A true commitment to Him that causes man to act. A true saving belief in which God gifts us with salvation. And we're changed into radically different people, given a new heart. Washed up in a good way. And that's what the David the new heart. He believes and he's baptized. And it says that that message of the cross goes all the way to his family, to his household. This would be relatives and non-relatives, people who were in the household. And so you see the spreading of the Great Commission still happening in Acts 16, and it's not done. It's just a wonderful reminder of where God will take us to use us. That's why I say it's such a bold, dangerous prayer to go to God and, and ask, will you use me however you see fit? Will you use me whatever you want? That's bold and dangerous because if we mean that, he may take us. To places we're not comfortable with. He may take us and, put, and place us in situations that we're not very comfortable with. But he'll use it for his glory. And it will be fruitful. He who started a good work in us, what? He'll continue. He, he doesn't just prod us along and hope for the best. When he calls you salvation, guess what? You're saved. When he starts in you, he finishes in you. He won't throw us out to the world and out to the wolves just to leave us. He'll do great things for his glory, beautiful things for his glory. Look down at verses 35 through 40. We'll, we'll begin to, to bring things to a close right here. Verse 35. Now when they came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now. And go in peace. Now, I will take a, a, just a brief moment before I get to verse 37. If you were with us um, this past Wednesday, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, I, I spoke very briefly about uh, when Jesus is giving the, the parable about the log and the speck and you know, the brother's eye. And there's this, um, there's this innocence. I gave a story about this, uh, this evangelist, or actually he's a, he's a pastor. He's an author. He wrote a book. Um, he was telling that story to his child, to his son. If you were with us Wednesday, you'll remember this. He's telling about the story, and he, he says, you know, if you, 
If you're kind of, if you're kind of getting a speck out of someone's eye, you've got this log coming out of your face, and the son started laughing. And he said, well, son, why are you laughing at that? This is, this is the word of God. You shouldn't laugh at that. And the boy said, that's just crazy that you would see something like that out of someone's eye. The, the altar was saying, no, Jesus is not being, you know, he's not making a joke there, but there's this innocence to just seeing how ridiculous that is. Uh, there's, there's little bits of, I, I guess I call it ironic humor, sprinkled throughout the scriptures. I would say this, when you start at verse 37, don't be afraid to chuckle. I think there's some humor going on with what Paul's doing. And it's not meant to just give us a kind of, you know, make us have a good time to laugh. But I think you're going to see some, some, something really clever coming out starting in verse 37. 37. Don't take this so seriously that you can't grin, that you can't chuckle. So go back to verse 37, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick up right back there. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. Verse 40, they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Wouldn't you want to be known as so annoying as a Christian? They're begging you to leave. <laughs> They're asking, please get out. You're going to get some trouble, man. They wanted to be out because Paul, when he reveals a little, little something that he didn't say when he first heard him beat them. He said, you do realize we're, we're Romans, right? And I want you to, we don't know what Paul looks like in his face, but I, I, I can see this going down. He's talking to these authorities, and Paul's got his arms cut across. He's got this little grill and says, you know, we're Romans, right? And so you, you wanted to, to do this in public, but you want to release this in secret? I don't think so. You get them to come out here and take us out in public. And so now Paul's got the upper hand. This is really, really clever, by the way. And it's okay to smile at it. This man has just been beaten and flogged, bleeding from his skin, and he's saying, um, excuse me? No, you go get your supervisors. You're asking the manager of the store? <laughs> You're in there a lot? That's what Paul's doing. You go get your supervisors. And guess what's going to happen to these men when they find out? They're going to get beat by Romans. The Roman authorities are going to beat the Roman magistrates for doing this because they, they didn't follow protocol. And Paul knows it. And Paul knows it. Now, there's something, again, really, really beautiful that happens here. They go in peace. I'm, I'm finishing here. We're done pretty much. They go in peace to Lydia's house, right? Now, they're not authorized to go and worship and practice this. They're not under, they're not given Roman authority to go out and continue practicing uh, this, this faith in Christ Jesus. And the text did not explicitly say this. But why do you think they were able to go out in peace? It wasn't just because they wanted to cover it up. Okay? They wanted Paul to leave so they didn't get in trouble. I guarantee you, Paul made a little, a little negotiation at this point. He didn't call the supervisors. He, didn't, he, could have, he could have gone to the very top and said, kill me. He didn't do that. They leave. I guarantee you what happened. I promise you what happened. This is one of those things where yes, opinion, I'm telling you, this is what happens. Paul looks me out and says, we're going to go to this household. We're going to go in peace. And you're going to leave us alone. Or else, I will be reporting what you've done. That's a smart man right there. That's a smart, smart man. And how beautiful is it for them to go back into this household and have the worship. And it says, when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them to depart. Beautiful. It's just beautiful. You get a moment where they are the lowest of the low, and then they have the upper hand on Rome in one chapter. God knows what he's doing. God knows exactly what he's doing with his people. It wouldn't matter if Paul and Silas had their heads chopped off in this very chapter. He knows what and there's something just amazing to see the people of God obediently go wherever He calls them and to see this, this, this glory be given to God. This beautiful portrait of obedience, this beautiful portrait of God who is sovereign and in control, doing things and using His people for His, for his, for his own glory is just wonderful. I love 
this book and this chapter so much. I'm so excited for us to continue on with Acts 17, not this coming Sunday, but the next. We're going to see some, some continuation of God working in this way. Let's see the church doing some amazing things. I'm very excited for us and the church to go through this together. Let's go to the Lord. Amen. 